All right, more on this hypothesis testing business, although the real numbers are still not going to be coming at you fast and furious here. Just, just a preparation. Let's talk about how we calculate P in a hypothesis test. Now, perhaps the simplest case to, of a numerical hypothesis case test is a one sample mean test where we have one sample mean and we're trying to compare it against a null hypothesis population mean and determine if it's plausible that our sample came from that null hypothesis situation here. So the hypothesis test of a sample mean is, of course, about sample means. So we need a distribution of sample means, and we need that to compare our sample means to other sample means that would have occurred if the null hypothesis is true. It always has to be apples to apples, oranges to oranges. If we have a sample mean and we want to know anything about that sample mean, we have to compare it to other sample means. That's what we have to do. Otherwise, mathematically, you can't really make the comparison most of the time. So we don't look for areas in distributions of raw scores <clears throat> for confidence intervals or for hypothesis tests, because that what doesn't make any sense. We look for areas in sampling distributions of the mean. So if you're asking, if somebody walks up behind you like an instructor and says, you're sketching that graph and you're shading in this area, what is that distribution? You say, it's the sampling distribution of the means. And then you can say, sir, if you want, you can say, uh, Master, Darren, Rogers, Sir, Grand, High, Kuba of the class, anything you like after that. But the first part is important. It's the sampling distribution of the means. So the null hypothesis model, just to recap quickly, hypothesis testing is based on this. We have to assume the null. Everything is all about the null being true. We start with the null. The null model is what we specify, and then we place our observed data in that null model to see how likely our observed data would be in that null model. The more you think about it, the weirder it gets. I think it gets comfortable after a while, and then after it gets comfortable, you think about it more, and then you start to think, this is really kind of strange. Why do we do this? And then you're with all the other statisticians who wonder why we all do this, and you can be one of those critics. So more detailed than in the last video, talking about the distribution implied by the null hypothesis. Actually, two distributions. That's a distribution of raw scores and then a distribution of means. So the null hypothesis says, um, <clears throat> or maybe doesn't say directly, but it will imply that there should be a certain distribution of values. So I'm, I tend to use this dashed line here to represent the raw score distribution. So the null hypothesis implies some raw score distribution, and then it implies a mean of that raw score distribution. And then you imagine all the sampling, and if I were to take an infinite number of samples with sample size the same as mine, and take the means from each of those samples from this population that the null hypothesis says should exist, and then I were to plot those all on one little graph here, that would be the distribution of means, so the sampling distribution of the mean. So this is the null model. The dashed line is where it starts from, but it ends up being the sampling distribution of means or sampling distribution of the means. This is the null hypothesis model we work with. Now, when we calculate P, we have to remember that the sampling distribution of the means is very normal as long as we've met the conditions for normality. And we've talked about those conditions before for confidence intervals. They're pretty much the same. The conditions are that either the original distribution has to be pretty normal to start with so that the sampling distribution of the means gets even more normal, or if the original distribution wasn't terribly normal, then you can still have a normal sampling distribution if you have a large sample size. So if you had a, some significant skew in the original distribution, then you should get a sample size, you know, 40, 50, 60, 100, something like that, depending on the amount of skew that you have. You should, your sampling distribution will get much, much more normal as soon as the sample size of all the samples that were used to create that sampling distribution gets bigger. So anyway, central limit theorem, as I just mentioned. So we can use the normal approximation to find p-values. That's why we learned how to use z-scores to find areas in a normal curve, because of this. That's the only thing we really care about. We don't really care about estimating the probability of two people getting a different GRE score on the ACT. I don't know. All those things were just made up things. I know you feel manipulated. I, you, you still can use this stuff for that. But the only reason we really care in stats about whether you can use the normal model is so you can do hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. And you're going to use the normal model on sampling distributions, not on raw distributions very much. It'll be rare to use it on a raw distribution, except to impress your friends, because they don't understand uh, sampling distributions. So we calculate a z-score, and then we find the p, the probability, 
in the normal probability table, right? You know how to do this. You can calculate a z-score if I give you a raw score and a mean and a standard deviation of the distribution that that raw score is in, you can calculate the z-score. And then you can look in your normal probability table and you can figure out what the probabilities are. Like if I said, what's the probability of that raw score or higher being randomly selected if you were to randomly select something from this distribution, right? You can do that. Well, all you have to remember is the consequences of doing this with means instead of raw scores. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. It's still one value. It's still a normal distribution. So we don't calculate a z-score from a raw score anymore. We calculate it from our sample mean. And so the distribution we, we use with the mean and the standard deviation to find that z-score has to be the mean and the standard deviation of a distribution of means. So it's the distribution of the null model. It's the distribution of all possible sample means if the null hypothesis was true. And then we calculate the z-score of our sample in that distribution. And then when we find the probability, we remember that the center of the sampling distribution of means is mu zero. It's the mean implied by the null hypothesis. So we always find areas going away from the center of this distribution. We look in the center of the distribution when we're looking for confidence intervals, but we look out on the tails, one or both tails, when we're looking for values for a hypothesis test. This is how you find a z-score, right? Well, what we're going to do is a single sample means test, which is sometimes called a z-test. And it's pretty much the same. See? Do you see how that, that worked there? Isn't that amazing? Okay, I know I couldn't get the, everything lined up perfectly, but they do turn green and get bars over them. See how all the x's turns to x bars? So this is z of x is calculated by the x itself, the raw score, minus the mean of the raw scores, divided by the standard deviation of the raw scores. Well, the z of your mean is your mean minus the mean of all the means divided by the standard deviation of all the means. This is pretty easy, right? This, if you remember, all these means turning into the incredible hope. There we go. That mean is the one that's implied by the null hypothesis, which happens to be the same as mu zero. Because remember, the mean of the means is the mean. So the mean of the raw scores, according to the null hypothesis, is the same as the mean of all the sample means, of the sampling distribution of means, according to the null hypothesis. And then the standard error of the mean is the standard deviation of this distribution. Remember, it's just a standard deviation of a normal distribution, or of any distribution, really, but it'll be pretty normal. And it's just the standard error of, well, the standard error is just the sampling distribution of the sampling distribution, it's the, st sorry, it's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of means. So building this up once again, we need to specify, actually, you don't need to do this. Um, I'm going to drop the dashed line eventually because I'll assume that you know this and that you can remember this if prompted. But this is all based on the idea of uh, thinking of all the possibilities for raw score observations implied by the null hypothesis, this dashed line. We figure out where the mean of all those distributions or of all those samples, those observations, sorry, uh, where the mean of that raw score distribution should be. And then we imagine the sampling distribution of means, according to the null hypothesis. And then, finally, we take our actual sample data, we calculate the mean from our sample data, x bar, and we place it on here. And then the p-value is the area beyond this. And that area is much smaller if our sample is far away from the mean of the null hypothesis, or the mean according to or implied by the null hypothesis. And that p-value is much bigger if our sample mean is really close to the null hypothesis. So big p-value, bad for our alternative hypothesis. Small p-value, good for our alternative hypothesis. So this p-value is good for our null hypothesis, or our alternative hypothesis, because look, this mean, a small p-value means that our sample mean is not very close to what the null hypothesis said should be true. But a large p-value means that our sample mean is very close to what the null hypothesis said should be true. So it's quite plausible. There we go. And pat myself on the back for those graphics. I'm like, I'm going to tell you that. Uh, here's another way to look at this just briefly. This is kind of how I think of things really conceptually. I think of a mean as having come from somewhere. I'm not the only one. I got this from other stats teachers. But with a confidence interval, you have this sample mean, and you say, 
the sample mean is here on the number line. <laughs> like the little puppy you found it. I found you on this street, so you must have come from one of these houses around here. That's my best guess. A hypothesis test is different. You think, would I have found you on this street if you actually came from that nasty null hypothesis house? What are the odds that I would have found you on this street if you actually came from that horrible, disgusting, no hypothesis house that I hope you didn't come from. Just two different ways of looking at trying to figure out where the sample mean came from. So, Because that, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out which population it came from. With confidence intervals, we try to specify that population as much as possible from our limited sample. With the null hypothesis, we don't specify the population that our sample mean came from at all. All we do is we try and rule one of them, rule another one out. We just try and say it's not very likely that this would have happened if it came from this other population. Two very different logical approaches, but they use all the same tools, sampling distributions, means. So if we've got some numerical variable here, and here's our observed mean, our observed sample mean, and our null hypothesis mean, we're basically asking, is this null hypothesis mean a, a plausible explanation where our sample mean came from? Is that distribution implied by the null hypothesis a plausible explanation for where our sample mean might have come from? And this leads us to this uh, question or this, this issue that you should kind of keep in mind so you don't get confused. The sampling distribution and the null hypothesis, or sorry, the sampling distribution for confidence intervals and for the null hypothesis, they're essentially the same except for one thing, where their center is. That's all. So sample mean, null hypothesis mean, they both have this sampling distribution of means. So there's the raw scores, there's the distribution of all possible means. So when we're doing a confidence interval, we just take our best guess, which is we say, we'll take our best guess for the mean of the population, which is our sample mean, because we've got nothing else to go on, and our best guess for the population standard deviation, which could be something given to us somewhere where we, we know it, what it is, or we can estimate it by saying it's probably about the same as our, as our sample standard deviation. Either way, we just need mean and standard deviation. We know the distribution of means would be somewhat normal, right? And so we can estimate all the possibilities for the, the population distribution of all samples, the sampling distribution of the means. And then we can construct our camp confidence interval around that. But, but we center that distribution on our sample mean. Well, if we, want to do no, if we want to do hypothesis testing this way, then we just plunk the null hypothesis mean, the implied mean, down in the middle of that diagram. And so we have a model based on our sample. And then we say, how likely is it that the null hypothesis mean would happen given our sample. So it's the probability of the null given our data, sort of like that. But the null hypothesis situation is this. When we do hypothesis testing, we specify the distribution according to the null hypothesis. We say the null hypothesis sets everything. Here's the distribution of all possible sample means if the null hypothesis were true. And now, the null hypothesis is the king, and our anything else has to prove itself worthy. I think of it as our sample mean trying to escape from the null hypothesis, because the farther away it gets, the more likely you are to make a decision to reject the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis, how well do you fit in, into my world? You hope the answer is not very well as a researcher most of the time. So p-values are always about a comparison between your data and the null hypothesis. The p-value is the probability of your observed data or data more extreme, more unlikely, occurring if the null hypothesis were true. You should just repeat that to yourself about 10,000 times. I'll repeat it 9,000. You go the other thousand, please. So breaking this down, if the null hypothesis is true, then what we want to know and what the p-value estimates for us is what is the probability of observing not a raw score value, but the difference between our sample mean and the null hypothesis mean. What's the difference? Because remember a z-score, which we're using here, we're using a z-score of means instead of a z-score of raw, of raw scores. A z-score expresses a difference. It expresses the difference between your, your raw score and the mean of its distribution expressed in standard deviations. It's how many standard deviations are you different from the mean, right?
Well, this Z test, this hypothesis test, is the same thing. The difference between your sample mean and the null hypothesis implied mean expressed in standard deviations, standard deviations of the distribution they're in, distribution of means. So if the null hypothesis is true, what is the probability of observing the difference we just observed between our sample mean and the null hypothesis? Or more different. So this is p-value expressed slightly differently, but this is the p-value. You need to understand the logic of a p-value if you wish to get points on my tests, if you want to understand stats. So we've got this whole situation, the imaginary population, the sampling over and over again, blah, blah, blah. That leads to the sampling distribution of means, the null hypothesis model that has the implied null hypothesis mean right at its center. Now here's the piece we haven't put in so far, alpha. Alpha is our benchmark, it's our cutoff value, it's our number to beat, it's our end zone. If the mean can run away from the null hypothesis far enough and make it into that end zone, touchdown, you reject the null hypothesis. But then we add in the z value that goes with our mean. Now you could just add in your mean, but we convert everything into z scores so that it's standardized. So we don't just want to know the number of um, inches or points or degrees Celsius that our, that our sample mean is away from the null hypothesis mean. That's too much calculation. So we turn everything into z scores first. So we look at the standardized version of things. We want to know how many standard errors, standard deviations that is, standard errors our raw, our, our raw mean is, our observed mean is, away from what the null hypothesis said it should be. And then the area beyond our z-score is p. So look at that red value that's alpha. p here is bigger. So we would not reject the null hypothesis because p is bigger than alpha. And a completely equivalent way to say that is because our sample mean, and therefore the z-score of our sample mean, because that's this, it's going to be in the same place on the distribution, our sample mean, our observed data, is too close to the null for us to reject the null hypothesis. It's too likely. So p greater than alpha, p less than alpha, that's just a shorthand way of telling ourselves how likely or how close our mean is to the null hypothesis implied mean. So in this case, p is greater than alpha. Do not reject the null hypothesis. But if our sample mean was over here, and therefore the z of our sample mean was also right there, then p would be less than alpha. We would reject the null hypothesis. So you see how that works? And this is really seriously don't reject the null hypothesis because p is greater than alpha for sure. And I'm trying to remember if I did the greater than and less than correctly on all the sample things. There we go, p is less than alpha. So this is for a positive one-tailed hypothesis test. So all hypothesis tests have this in common. You have this null hypothesis expected point estimate, a sample mean, and then your actual point estimate, the real sample mean you saw. So the null hypothesis value is the expected mean. It's the mean of all possible sample means. And then your sample mean is the one observed mean that you actually observed from your real data. And then you look at the difference between them and you calculate a p-value. Now, as we'll learn later, you don't actually have to calculate this sometimes. You can there's different ways, there's more than one way to skin this cat, right? You can calculate a p-value and that'll tell you how unlikely something is in the null hypothesis, or you can uh, just figure out whether something is far enough away from the mean of the null hypothesis. And yeah, we'll see this. You can use critical values instead. Anyway, if your sample value is far enough away by whatever method you choose to figure that out, then you reject the null hypothesis. If it's not, then you don't reject the null hypothesis. And then you write a conclusion. That's when you go back and say what you think is true in the hypothesis, or sorry, in the populations, and answer the original question uh, based on what you found. So more reminders about the sampling distribution. I know I'm hitting this about 1,200 times, but it's hard stuff. Think through it. Instead of getting bored and saying, he's saying that thing about the sampling distribution again, force yourself to think through it very carefully make sure you get all the details. So sampling distribution is all possible point estimates if the null hypothesis was true. So like all sample means, so if you're testing a sample mean, then it's all possible sample means. But warning you, this, is, this gets more complicated when we look at pairs of sample means and looking at the difference between them, then the null hypothesis is all possible differences between pairs. And when you're looking at multiple sample means, then you're calculating the variability among meaning means, and then the sampling distribution is all possible variabilities among means. It just, it's the same pattern, but we keep adding details to make it slightly more tricky.
But back to what we're at right now, we have one sample mean, and we compare that to all possible sample means if the null hypothesis were true, and we just look to see where our sample mean fits. But this is a one-tailed um, hypothesis test, which is where I'm really hoping I got the greater thans and less thans correct. Here's the, the null model, the sampling distribution of means as implied by the null hypothesis. And there's alpha. The red, red business is alpha here. I like to make alpha. So let's say we set our alpha at 0.05. And there's our sample value. That's how it falls in that normal distribution. Crap. Greater than 0.05. We could say that might be like a P is 0.14. We would not reject the null hypothesis. But what if we had a smaller P value? In other words, our sample mean was further away from the null hypothesis. Well, maybe this P is 0.01. P is less than 0.05. P is less than alpha. Woohoo, we reject the null hypothesis. But we've got a really big one right here. That's huge. P is 0.48, probably. And so we do not reject the null hypothesis. What about this one? Barely made it. It's 0 0.04, 0 0.04. Yay, reject the null hypothesis. But if we had set alpha at 0 0.01, we would not have rejected that null hypothesis. Know what I'm saying? Would not have happened. So we can think of this as a, as a negative hypothesis test too, a directional test in the negative direction. Um, same null model, but then we would put alpha on the negative side. Oops, I didn't extend my red far enough to be totally off the edge of the screen. Sorry about that. I'm sure you can, your imagination can compensate. So if our sample value is in that rejection region, if it's in the end zone, then yeah, touchdown. We reject the null hypothesis. There we go. Our Z ran far enough away from that zero that it escaped into freedom land. So maybe here P is 0.05, which is less than 0.05. Uh, here it's too big. It's too close. Our sample value is too close to the mean. Therefore, the area under the curve is bigger than alpha. So P is 0.32. It's too big. That blue area is much bigger than 0.05. Or here's a nice solid rejection. P is 0.003 maybe, if I estimated and eyeballed it kind of correctly. And then here, we didn't quite make it. P is 0.09 in this case. Not less than 0.05. Sorry, don't be a weasel and claim that it is. Sample uh, hypothesis testing is pretty silly in some senses, but in for a penny, in for a pound. If you're going to hypothesis test, do it right. So all hypothesis tests have the null hypothesis expected point estimate, sample observed point estimate. So the null hypothesis value kind of comes from theory or previous research. It comes from outside your, your scenario, outside your research study. But your sample value, you have no control over that. It comes from your study. It's just what happens. It's just the results. And then you calculate the difference between them. And you calculate the p-value, you make a decision, and you make your conclusion. You write your conclusion or state your conclusion. The conclusion is the verbal part. Everything else is kind of mathy, logic-y, but then the conclusion goes back to verbal. And we're all done with this one.